Right, so I'm going to talk about um, allergic fungal sinusitis. And I'll just, uh, there it is. Thank you very much. And I'm going to just focus, uh, because of the short time that we have, I'm just going to focus on uh, diagnosis and management and, um, and give you just the salient features of, um, of, our, of my thoughts. So just um, some important points. Um, AFRS is really a non-invasive fungal disease, so very different than what we just saw. Uh, it's really a subclass of chronic sinusitis, and it uh, affects about 7 to 10 percent of your chronic sinus patients. Uh, it's the exact same phenotypic expression as uh, CRS with nasal polyposis, uh, but remember that there are several subtypes, and there's a lack of sensitive diagnostic tools. So you really have to be very aware, um, and, and you have to be alert. Uh, that, you're, that this might be present to find it successfully. So the original uh, benton kuhn classification diagnostic criteria had five uh, criteria that were present in every one of their cases out of the 11 criteria that they were looking for. And, um, and those are still considered the five that we want to look for in patients that we see. Uh, but there is a sixth one that was added recently, and that's immunocompetence. So most of these patients, or all of these patients, uh, should have should be immunocompetent. Um, but remember, when you're looking for these uh, patients in your in your clinics, uh, not all of them will fulfill all of these criteria. But um, I suspect that the ones that are that have stars on it um, will show up much easier. It's hard to culture fungus from every lab. You need to have a good mycology lab if you're going to fung culture fungus, uh, or even to look at it in a smear. And uh, type 1 uh, Ig mediated hypersensitivity is sometimes hard to prove in these patients as well. But um, those three that I've starred are accepted at most sinus centers as diagnostic enough, unless you're doing research kind of work. And remember, this disease may em em uh, embody several nested subtypes as well that I'll uh, talk about later. So the pathophysiology is um, very difficult to figure out, continues to remain unknown. And the most important thing to you realize is that the answer probably lies at the level of the host and not the fungus. The issue is, the, the, the problem here is the patient, not the fungus. And all of us get respond, all, all of us get exposed to the same fungi, but the AFRS patient's response to the fungi is what's responsible for the inflammation of the side of the interaction with the outside world. So there's a, obviously a specific endotype or a cytokine profile that's present in these patients. And so the more you think about it, the more the disease gets fragmented, and this is sort of where we are sitting at right now. So all patients have a classic CT scan, or, and that's usually with a double density sign. Uh, all patients have polyposis. All patients will have this thick, cheesy eosinophilic mucin. Uh, and all patients are immunocompetent. But beyond that, uh, we need to break this down even further uh, because there's some patients where you just will not grow a, a culture, no matter how hard you try. Uh, and we call them eosinophilic patients versus sort of allergic patients or fungal patients. Uh, and then you have patients who have elevated IgEs versus normal IgEs. Uh, and then you have a younger group versus an older group. And this is a nice table to have beside you when you're working to tell you where to slot these patients because you'll treat them a little bit differently as well. As far as clinical presentation goes, all these patients present very similarly to your regular chronic sinusitis with polyposis patients. Um, and so there's nothing different about them except that if you don't treat them for a long time, they may end up with uh, neurological deficits, seizures, uh, just simply from a, from a compression standpoint, because this will uh, push on the brain and will push on the orbit and create a proptosis. And this is, you know, how a patient might show up. Um, and when you scan them, I mean, you know, this patient had uh, very um, involved uh, sinuses with pushing margins into the brain uh, and into the orbit, but no invasion, right? So he's an immunocompetent 19-year-old patient uh, with very extensive disease. Uh, allergic mucin, you find it in almost all patients. It's very thick. Uh, it's peanut butter consistency. It fills up all the sinuses. It's very difficult to remove. And when you're, when you're in the OR, um, you'll get this very thick mucin that you'll pull out of the sinuses. And the most important thing to realize is these patients need 
very meticulous surgery. Every sinus needs to be opened properly, and all this mucin has to be removed, and you really have to work on it. You have to flush this junk out of their sinuses to get it all out, and if you don't get it all out, uh, it's likely that you, you know, you're not going to be successful in treating these patients. It can be present in the ear as well, so a lot of these patients will end up with ear issues, um, and so um, when you, if you end up doing a myringotomy, you'll find that the same mucin is in the ear as well. On the CT scan, they have this very classic double density or rail track pattern, which is caused by uh, heavy metals or manganese that's produced by the fungus. Uh, patients have a pushing margin type of CT scan, uh, and the CT scan is very suggestive and almost diagnostic uh, by itself. Uh, on MR, you'll see a signal void uh, on both T1 and T2. You know, pre-treatment, you put your scope in, and this is what you see, and this is really what you want to end up with, and this is how you want to keep it, and maintenance becomes a real challenge in these patients. So in the early 2000s, um, when I was doing my fellowship with Fred Kuhn, and when I came back to practice, um, we were using a very large amount of um, prednisone in these patients, as you can see. Um, and then we would start them on amphotericin B, nasal irrigations. And then for recurrences, we would use uh, doses of oral prednisone. So these patients were getting a ton of systemic steroids, and that was, you know, worrisome. Um, what are we going to do about these patients in the long term? Because many of these patients were young teenagers, and you could imagine how much steroids they were going to get through their lifetime. So things changed. Uh, we, we found different things, and one of the things that really became a game changer was budesonide. Um, and the way we use budesonide is, is um, first of all, you, you do surgery on all these patients, do a complete surgery, and really that's a very important step. Beyond that, uh, we start all these patients on topical steroids, um, and we start with saline impregnated budesonide, uh, and we use usually a higher dose than what's in the literature, usually two nebules in 240 mils, and then we keep increasing the concentration um, until, the point, until to the point where we might use direct budesonide into their sinuses. We will add, uh, as a second step, we'll add uh, antileukotrienes, so Montelukas will be our second step, and then our third step is systemic antifungals. Now looking at this, about 80% of patients will be controlled in the post-surgery topical budesonide group, and then the 20% the that fail are the ones that are going to get the stepwise treatment with increasing um, medication. And Spornox, is, it doesn't come without its complications. And in uh, a group of patients that we uh, studied, 6% of patients ended up with hepatotoxicity. So if you're going to use Spornox uh, or itraconazole, be really careful that you do their liver function tests and their cardiac function tests on a regular basis. They do work in a synergi synergistic effect. Again, this is something that we, we haven't published and need to publish, um, but uh, we find that when we use Spornox and Montelukas together, we get a synergistic effect in these patients. Antibiotics are only used when necessary, when they have an infection, uh, a bacterial infection on top of a, a fungal issue. And then the latest things that we're using are biologics, and one of the things that we have found is that dupilumab um, actually has some very interesting results, and we're just... Um, about to start doing a retrospective analysis of all our patients who are on dupilumab. And oral steroids are used as a last resort. I would say we use oral steroids in maybe less than 1% of patients now who have uh, allergic fungal sinusitis. And then there are experimental therapies that I'll talk about uh, a little bit later. Long-term follow-up and maintenance is a critical aspect of these patients. We will follow them for the rest of their lives uh, we start w watching them every six week, every four weeks after surgery for the first year, and then every six weeks after that. And depending on how well they do, we may alter that between what they need. So some patients may come in every four weeks, and some patients may come in every three months, depending on how active their disease is at the time. So um, at every visit, we'll do an endoscopic scoring, so a, a mucosal staging system that is uh, very important to follow this disease in the long term. We have a uh, staging system that we have published and validated. It's, it's called the Phil Poche-Javert Endoscopic Scoring System. Uh, so if you're interested in following these patients, that's a really nice way to follow these patients. And if they have uh, fun fungi and bacteria present, please culture them at every visit. 
And then we follow total eosinophilic, uh, serum IgE and eosinophilic count uh, at each visit. And um, there's good data to show that the total serum IgE uh, will parallel the mucosal stage of this disease. And, and so it's a very good marker to have present. Um, and all of this data has uh, been published. So mucosal staging system, the first one that, has, that was out there was the Kipferberg system. Very simple system, uh, not great to identify the different sinuses and the different sides that were involved. Um, basically, it was a stage zero to three. And if you had a stage three at the frontal sinus in the left side, then the whole left side was called a stage three, which we thought was not very accurate. So um, we came up with a staging system of our own, which we felt was more accurate uh, and more sensitive. So what we did is we divided their staging system, the Kipferberg system, into, we took each one of those sta their stages and divided it into three stages. We called it a mild, moderate, and severe. And then we gave each one of these staging um, aspects and divided them into each side and each site of the, of, the, of the sinuses and the nose. And then we gave the same numbers to the olfactory cleft as a separate site. So we ended up with a total of 50 on each side and a total of 100 for the entire uh, nostril for both sides. So when patients came in, you could score them out of 100, and then you could track them. So if, you, if they went from a, a 40 to a 60, uh, you knew that they were getting worse and you needed to increase your treatment um, algorithm. So a very nice, simple staging system that's been validated um, and published. So um, the, the treatment options have changed. Um, we, have, we have pretty much stopped using oral steroids. Uh, we have stopped using topical amphotericin B because we just didn't find it worked well. Um, oral uh, antifungals actually have um, shown some efficacy. In our study, 40% of patients actually responded to oral antifungals. Uh, their cytokine profile remains to be unknown. It's a study that is ongoing. Manuka honey works in about 20 to 30 percent of patients, and we do know that uh, these are patients who have an elevated IL-8 and IL-13. This was a study that we published as well. And so if you do profiling, you will know ahead of time which patients are going to respond to Manuka honey. Uh, and then the topical steroids. But really the thing that changed everything was uh, topical budesonide. Uh, which has been the most useful thing. And this is how we've been using it. <clears throat> so for patients who fail um, ir uh, budesonide and irrigation, we've been using it directly in this syringe called an MAD syringe, which is um, available commercially. And it basically just atomizes or mists the medication. And so you take a nebula of palmicort and then just put it in the, uh, the patient applies it himself with his head hanging over the edge of the bed. And this works really well. Uh, particularly for frontal sinus uh, disease, uh, and it settles it down very nicely because irrigations will not make it to the frontal sinus, and this is the only way to get the medication into the frontal sinus. The question is systemic absorption, and that's something that's been worrying us. So uh, this is our very first study on topical budesonide. We had 77 patients, uh, and we staged them, and the, you know they all did amazingly well over time. Um, and so the, the, at three months after using budesonide, um, most patients had either discontinued their steroids or reduced it significantly and had discontinued using um, interconazole. So it was obviously very successful. It was affordable. The compliance was good because it was so easy to use. Um, but the problem was, you know, how much of this was actually being absorbed uh, into the patients. Was there going to be any cataract formation or glaucoma formation? Um, how much bone resorption issues are we going to get this with patients? And is there going to be any HPA axis suppression? So we took some very intense studies uh, regarding absorption uh, and published them over the last um, four to five years. And we found some very interesting results. We found that with using higher concentrations of palmicort, there was a trend towards mild absorption, um, and particularly in patients that we use it over 40 weeks. So obviously these patients are going to be in, on it for their lifetime. So we found that there was a 3% increased risk um, of inter, uh, increased intracranial pressures, interorbital pressures, and 6% rate of asymptomatic abnormal ACTH tests. Now, none of these patients actually complained. They didn't have any symptoms but there was obviously a little bit of absorption going on here. So when you use a direct palmicord, you just need to be a bit careful 
uh, in the long term, and you need to watch them. So all our patients get yearly uh, uh, pressure, uh, eye pressure tests, they get yearly uh, ACTS stimulation tests, and they get uh, two yearly bone uh, mineral density tests uh, done. I just want to briefly mention Manuka honey. Uh, it's worked uh, incredibly well in a subgroup of patients. About 20 to 30 percent of patients have responded really well to Manuka honey. Uh, it's very expensive to use, um, but it, it does work uh, well. And there is commercial Manuka honey rinses available. In our group of patients, only 40 percent responded. And when we went back and looked at their cytokine profile, they did have an elevated IL-8 and IL-13. So. Um, we use it quite often in the beginning, right after their surgery, uh, to settle the inflammation. It's a great anti-inflammatory, and then we'll switch to just straight budesonide because it's much cheaper. Future treatments, um, APDT, poloxamer gel, um, betadine, and nitric oxide releasing solution are the, are the things that are coming down the pipeline. Um, I'm not, I don't have too much time to talk about APDT, uh, but I just want to say that it's a blue light treatment of the sinuses. Uh, that you put in the nose, you put a photosensitizer into the sinuses. Um, this is after a sinus has been completely flushed out, and then you, once you do that, you put your balloon in there, um, enlarge the balloon, and then shine the light on it. So it, it really works quite well, and I'll show you, this video is only about uh, 30 or 40 seconds long, so I'll show you the rest of it. But there is the balloon going in, and then we uh, expand the balloon just with simple saline. There's a filament of light that's going through the center of this tube. So it's like putting, basically putting a light bulb in the patient's sinus. As we expand the balloon, you notice that a whole bunch of um, junk, crud, will come out of the sinuses. Most of these patients have, um, have, a, have a biofilm on their walls of the sinus, and you, you basically flush that out and then you turn on the blue, uh, the light, um, and obviously it appears red to your eye, but the, the one that's being absorbed is uh, uh, 670 nanometers, and then you let the patient sit there for four to eight minutes. We're doing, we did eight minute treatments in our initial trials, and now we've reduced it to four minutes with the same effectiveness. And it, is, it does do a 99.9% .9 kill, uh, so you're left with a very sterile sinus. Uh, another thing that we are actually using is poloxamer 407 gel, which is a thermoreversible gel, which means it's liquid and cold and, and uh, gel in warm environments. And uh, we can put all sorts of medication in this gel. And it works really well for our fungal patients. We can, we, we can put uh, itraconazole and, and budesonide together in this gel and leave it in the sinuses, and it sits there for five, five days uh, and works really well. So uh, I'll just show you. 10 seconds of this video where you can just see the gel. It goes out, it comes out as a liquid, and then we're just demonstrating how it just sticks on the mucous membrane, uh, like spot welding, uh, and turns into a gel as soon as it touches the mucous membrane because the body is much warmer um, than what's in the fridge. So um, very good um, results with that. Iodine rinses have also worked very well. This is something that we just presented here yesterday. Uh, and we've had some amazing results with uh, these patients. Nitric oxide is something that we're just starting to, to study, um, and we've learned how to put nitric oxide in solution. Patients rinse their nose out with it, and we have found some very good early results, um, and we're just starting a prospective uh, small study on this, and this will come out fairly shortly, so stay tuned. So uh, a paradigm shift, we need to know how we're treating these patients, before we start using the treatment, uh, and this is something that we really need to learn, is to do cytokine profiling in these patients before we uh, start treating them. Thank you very much.